Hello everyone, I am Be Better Gamer. Welcome to Be Better Gamer Wrestling. This channel is dedicated to the classic series of N64 wrestling games developed by Aki Corporation, WCW NW World Tour, Virtual Pro Wrestling 64, WCW vs NW Revenge, WrestleMania 2000, Virtual Pro Wrestling 2, and WWF No Mercy, which is the subject of today's video where I'm continuing down my hardcore championship path and I am playing as Shane McMahon, the prodigal son, the golden child, the sins of the father, whatever you want to call him, Shane O'Mac, um, recently returned to us to WWE at WrestleMania against The Undertaker in a Hell in a Cell match. And the reason why I'm doing Shane McMahon, I got a question as to why I'm doing Shane McMahon for the Hardcore Championship except for the European Championship because he did hold the European Championship for about 40 or so days. He did, you know, hold it significantly longer. I think that Shane McMahon's impact in WWE uh, started really when he got the Hardcore Championship and Shane McMahon has kind of been known for being this daredevil, um, you know, uh, this this wild and crazy, you know, he'll do these crazy stunts as WrestleMania proved when he dived off the top of the Hell in a Cell. That's what Shane McMahon's kind of known for. I mean, Shane McMahon, the wrestler, I mean, he's always been very capable in the ring. He's very athletic, always doing his dancing like I just did right now with the taunts. I'm going up against Briscoe. And going for the big dive, missing there. Uh, Shane McMahon has been known to miss some of his big dives and spots, but I thought it'd be fitting because if I'm going to talk about Shane McMahon, you know, you're going to want to talk about a lot of his hardcore accomplishments because even though he only held the hardcore championship for pretty much a week, um, his legacy really is circled around his various street fights and no holds barred matches and hell in a cell and all that so i'm gonna get into that i'm gonna talk about that um you know playing as shane mcmahon in wwf no mercy is very interesting because again he's got a very generic move set um you know, there's nothing really too crazy. His his finisher is those like punching jabs that Shane McMahon was always known for. So, really, if you're playing as Shane McMahon, you know you're playing because you're kind of a fan of Shane McMahon. I wouldn't say there's anything too spectacular about his move set or that he does anything special in this game. I mean, I think the one thing that does stick out to me when I think about Shane McMahon in No Mercy is that in a lot of the championship paths you're always going up against the corporation so you're always going up against Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon and there's a lot of times where you'll face them in handicap matches so this is kind of like playing as the villain in a way you know if you if you're looking at it from like the video game you know perspective so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into a little bit about that but so Shane McMahon real quick before I get into the hardcore championship I should talk about his European championship you know he he won it on an episode of Raw on February 15th, 1999, in a tag match, actually, uh, X-Pac was the champion, and he ch and he was teaming with Triple H, and um, they were feuding, you know, DX was feuding with the corporation, so Shane McMahon teamed up with Kane, and if anyone pinned X-Pac, he would lose the title. So in this tag match, which I always think is kind of like a silly thing when they put up the single championships in a tag match, but whatever, um, it's not the first time, it's not the last time they've done it. And Shane McMahon ended up getting the pin off of X-Pac in that match. So the the whole Shane McMahon getting the European Championship was really um, because of the storyline feud of Shane McMahon and the corporation feuding with DX. So Shane McMahon was feuding mainly with X-Pac. And this led into a match at WrestleMania 15 where Triple H actually betrayed X-Pac in that match, Triple H and China, um, and they sided with the corporation. This was one of the many times DX kind of like split apart, but then X-Pac would team up with Kane and all that jazz. I'm pretty sure I think I'd cover that in my X-Pac European Championship path. But yeah, Shane McMahon held it for 43 days. He would, he would retire the belt because he wasn't really defending it. You know, he only won it to kind of like, you know, screw X-Pac over. And Midian, who was a member of the corporation at the time, found it in Shane McMahon's duffel bag. And Shane McMahon just gave it to him. And then Midian would go on to lose it to D'Lo Brown, who would become the first European and Intercontinental Champion, holding both belts at the same time, the first Eurocontinental Champion. So I talk about that at length 
in my D'Lo Brown European Championship. But yeah, I guess that's that's really the extent of Shane McMahon's contribution to the European Championship. It really was just a prop in the feud of uh, X Pac and Shane McMahon. The Hardcore Championship. You could say the same thing about the Hardcore Championship with Shane McMahon. It really was a prop for a brief feud that Shane McMahon had with Steve Blackman. But it was a very important match. In, ter- in terms of how we viewed Shane McMahon. So it was it was a hardcore match. You know, this was when the championship was under the 24-7 rules. But Mick Foley, who was the commissioner at the time, he waived the 24-7 rule for the Shane McMahon-Steve Blackman match, with, which happened at uh, SummerSlam 2000. So when Shane McMahon jumped Steve Blackman with the help of Edge Christian to take the title off of Steve Blackman uh, and also test... Also tried to help Tess and Albert try to help Shane McMahon take it off of Blackman. Uh, Mick Foley was like, you know what? I think uh, Steve Blackman deserves a rematch and uh, he's going to get it at SummerSlam. And no 24-7 rule to make sure you don't try to drop it to anyone and get out of this match. So um, this was the match. This was the match where Shane McMahon did his first big dive his big dive off of a structure you know again if you saw wrestlemania 32 in texas where shane mcmahon fought um the undertaker you know he dove off the top of the hell in the cell and everyone everyone pretty much going into that match that that was the big draw you know i mean it was great to see shane mcmahon back he wasn't back after like seven years of being on wwe tv you know he actually legitimately went left the company and went to go run another company over in china and become an executive over there and there was always a lot of rumors and you know as to why he left you know is him and his father not speaking does he hate the that his sister's getting more control this and that who knows i don't know i wasn't there i'm not a mcmahon i'm not privy to all the information i was just glad to see him back i thought it was strange that he was going to be facing the undertaker but then i was thinking about it i was like oh undertaker shay mcmahon hell in the cell oh he's jumping off of it and you know a lot of people had you know sort of that idea and definitely when you're watching that match and Shane McMahon when they break through the hell in the cell and Shane McMahon you know glances up ever so briefly people start losing their mind and you see the whole you know hundred thousand people erupting because they just know he's gonna start climbing it and that all comes from the backlash match I mean not backlash I'm sorry from the SummerSlam 2000 match that Shane McMahon had with Steve Blackman for the Hardcore Championship. You know, they started the match. Everything's normal. You know, Shane McMahon is getting the crap pretty much beat out of him by Steve Blackman. The whole match, Steve Blackman's hitting with the kendo sticks and uh, those um, tongs. I don't even know what you call them, but those, like, wooden sticks that he would bust out. And, you know, they're beating each other up with all these various things. They're fighting out onto the apron. They work their way up to the uh, SummerSlam set. And they're fighting the Summer Stamps and, and Steve Blackman is chasing Shane McMahon with the kendo stick. So to try to escape, Shane McMahon starts climbing the SummerSlam set. And Steve Blackman is following him. They're really high up. They're pretty high up and they get very high up. And it's basically like they're climbing the side of it, sort of like a ladder. And, you know, they, they get almost all the way to the top. They don't get fully all the way to the top. But Steve Blackman hits him a couple of times with the kendo stick and Shane McMahon falls backwards down he falls down into the ramp I guess you should say at the face of the arena obviously it was staged you know he didn't really fall they did it wasn't like they weren't planning on him to go through that piece it was all set up but it was still a pretty big drop and very unexpected I mean people probably hadn't seen something like that since Mick Foley got thrown off the top of the hell in the cell so this was like the next closest thing to something that can top that you know what i mean like something that like and especially shane mcmahon it's like who's shane mcmahon why is he falling from that high up against a a match against steve blackman you know like if you really think about it like it was so crazy and unexpected i mean shane mcmahon 
ever since he started competing in the ring, a lot of his fights revolved around street fights, but they weren't as intense as they got with this match. So this was really the turning point. You know, he even had like a grand street fight with X-Pac, you know, Mean Street Posse were involved with that. Every time he would usually be in a feud with like The Rock or someone else that was feuding with the corporation, they'd do street fight rules or no DQ or no holds barred or Greenwich street fight rules. I mean, you know, in the um, SummerSlam 99 even, when Shane McMahon was feuding with Test, who, it's very funny because Shane McMahon was feuding with Test in SummerSlam 99, and they had a street fight, and then here we are, flash forward, SummerSlam 2000, this is now we're into the McMahon-Helmsley era, Stephanie McMahon has left Test, because Test was fighting Shane for Stephanie's honor, and now he's helping Shane beat Steve Blackman at SummerSlam 2000, it's very interesting, um, how all that storylines changed in a year but this was the big street fight turning point for Shane McMahon and you know I, and that's why I wanted to do it for the hardcore championship here I am hitting bam hitting mankind with the barbed wire bat um you know and and I and I think you know I think like I mentioned it in my mankind video when I was talking about Mick Foley you know that dive off the hell in a cell really changed a lot uh, when it came to thinking of like you know these dangerous spots that 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 pretty much were like stunts, you know what I mean? It wasn't no one's doing a wrestling move onto anyone, you know what I mean? Like like Undertaker literally threw mankind off the top of the and mankind dove off the top of the Hell in a Cell. It's not like he got Huracarana off or Undertaker did a choke slam. Even I mean he did choke slam him through the top, but the <laughs> top of the hell cell wasn't supposed to break and it was also the weakest looking choke slam that Undertaker did because he probably didn't want mankind to fall through the top of the hell in the cell same thing with Shane McMahon it wasn't like Steve Blackman was doing a Russian leg sweep or anything like that he wasn't doing like a big you know DDT or something off the top he just literally hit Shane McMahon and Shane McMahon fell back because when you're falling at such high distance um you have to be very careful, I would imagine, because you, the margin of error is so small. If, if Shane McMahon jumps too far back, he could miss his landing pad, his crash pad, I believe was what they call it. So, and, and you know, it's funny because we all remember Steve, um, Shane McMahon falling backwards from there, but Steve Backman followed him. You know, everyone was cheering, everyone was chanting, you know, like, holy shit, like, you know, this is crazy. And then Steve Blackman's, like, feeding the audience, like, yeah, yeah, he he does a diving elbow right onto Shane McMahon. He follows him, he jumps right out after him. So, kudos for Steve Blackman, one of the best hardcore champions we've ever had. I will definitely do a Steve Blackman hardcore championship run and talk more about his times as hardcore champion. But... That was it. That was the beginning of Shane McMahon. I mean, and I should also mention the, the SummerSlam match, the 99 SummerSlam match with Tess. I had a big spot there with Shane McMahon doing the diving elbow from the turnbuckle to the Spanish announce table. Uh, again, which wasn't invented by Shane, but it became synonymous with Shane McMahon's arsenal. You know, he was either going to dive off of something huge of a set or he was gonna dive off to the Spanish announce table or later we'll talk about it he'll be doing the coast to coast so um but that kind of I think that kind of changed fans pers I mean that changed my perspective of Shane McMahon because again this is the son of Vince McMahon you know why is he putting his body on the line like that why is he trying to be the next Mick Foley like that's crazy the the last person you would expect to do something like that would be Shane McMahon but you know people have always talked about it Shane McMahon he tried very hard to be one of the boys and to earn respect and to have people see that he wasn't just the son of the owner of the company so he was going to be able to do whatever he want and you know get into all these matches just because he's a McMahon he wanted to prove that he was as tough as everyone else and he could hang and earn the respect and doing a lot of these wild crazy stunts was part of it he's also ad admitted to being kind of like an adrenaline junkie you know so he gets these kicks out of it you know which is crazy i mean i don't <laughs> you know i get nervous just going up a you know a large height of something where i don't if i don't feel safe i'll start getting a little nervous so kudos to shane mcmahon he's definitely doing a lot more than i would ever do but 
I mean, you know, he's a McMahon. It's in his blood. Um, so that was that was the one big thing. And then and then the next big feud, the next big feud that kind of uh, helped tell the story of this hardcore <laughs> legend, if you will, of Shane McMahon, uh, was the street fight, the WrestleMania street fight between Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon. And this was a, a real, in my opinion. I was never really a fan of a lot of the McMahon family feuds. You know, I thought the WrestleMania 2000, which is the WrestleMania that came out before this game came out. Um, so a lot of the storylines, a lot of the references of this game is based or off of WrestleMania 2000. But that was like the M- McMahon in every corner. And I really did not like that angle. I, I didn't. And looking back on it, I like it even less. But, you know, I didn't like that the fact that the McMahons were the focal point of the story when it really should have been, you know, The Rock and Triple H and Mick Foley and this and that. So, but I, by, with saying that, I do have to say that the WrestleMania 17 um, McMahon storyline, I enjoyed a lot better because I, th- I thought the payoff was better. I didn't like the payoff of WrestleMania 2000 because at the end of it, you just had... Three of them coming together anyway. You had Shane, Vince, and Stephanie all coming together and betraying The Rock. And Linda's just left there, you know, shrugging her shoulders. Um, but this time, you know, Vince McMahon was just being a terrible human being to Linda McMahon. And Shane disapproved. Stephanie was still sort of choosing Vince's side and going against her mother and they they did the whole you know crazy storyline of that uh linda mcmahon is sedated in a wheelchair she's numb to everything that's going on while vince mcmahon is like making out with trish stratus and berating her and she can't respond because she's sedated and all these crazy it was a crazy absurd angle (laughs) it really was but the payoff came at wrestlemania 17 because shane mcmahon shows up and he's like, you know what, my dad is doing is wrong, and I'm calling him out. And he disapproved of Vince, so they got into they got into it, and that led to the street fight at WrestleMania 17. And again, this was another moment where not just Vince McMahon put himself on the line, but Shane McMahon really, really stepped up as a performer because. Now he's got to work this match with his father. And let's face it, Vince McMahon, he's not a technician in the ring. But, you know, he's had entertaining matches in the ring before with guys like Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. But now it's like, all right, you don't have Austin there. You don't have The Rock there. You know, Mick Foley was the guest referee. But it was really just Shane and Vince that had to tell the story. And if you watch the match, like Shane really really steals the show in this match because not only does he do a great job you know he does his flying elbow off to the spanish announced table spot um he does um he does a shooting star press in this match i believe is this the match where he does the first shooting star press i believe so he does the shooting star press and he misses he lands on top of the trash can um but it's just an exciting match because you have then Stephanie comes out, I believe, Trish comes out, and just all these pieces are coming into play, and Trish turns on Vince, so Steph and Trish start fighting, and that's exciting to see because Trish, even though she was you know brought in by Vince to be sort of like the other woman, he started berating her and putting her down and. You know, he was just being a monster to everyone. So that was a great payoff to see Trish chase off of Stephanie. Vince slaps Mick Foley during the match. So Mick Foley attacks um, Vince McMahon during the match. And, you know, the big payoff came when Linda McMahon stood up. And Linda McMahon, you know, reveals that she's no longer comatose or whatever was going on with that. And she kicks Vince McMahon in the nuts and fans lose it. It really was a great payoff. I'm not going to lie. It was probably my favorite McMahon story that was ever told um, so far. I mean, you know, we're always going to have McMahon stories being told. Um, and but, but the highlight of that match was Shane McMahon doing the Van Terminator. Okay, it was called the Coast. He calls it the Coast to Coast now. It would eventually be called Coast to Coast because, you know, the Van Terminator, the Coast to Coast, if you don't know, it's the move that Shane McMahon does where he springboards from one end of the ring to the other doing a springboard dropkick, usually into a trash can or sometimes a chair. 
um, Van Damme came up with that move, and he actually came up. I remember that move vividly when it premiered because it premiered at the Heat Wave 2000 ECW pay per view. Van Damme had just returned from injury the ECW pay-per-view before and he fought Jerry Lynn and him and Jerry Lynn had this great rivalry and Scotty Anton aka Scotty Riggs cost Van Dam the match so Van Dam was like you know what at Heat Wave I'm gonna kick your ass I got a move that's gonna destroy you he's like cutting promos about this move that he's gonna unveil and Rob Van Dam around this time was like one of the he still is one of the best wrestlers, but like he was like untouchable in ECW, especially he had that long reign. And the only thing that stopped him from having that long 700 plus ECW TV title reign was his leg injury. He broke his leg, uh, I think, filming a movie or something like that. And so when he returned, it was like, oh, what's Van Dam gonna come up with? That's gonna be like this most amazing move ever, and he's gonna destroy Scotty Anton. It ended up being the Van Terminator. And it was such a crazy cool move to see because it's like, oh, only he could do that. Only Van Dam can do it. Only Van Dam is athletic enough and, you know, amazing enough that he can do something like that. He can jump from one end of the ring to the other perfectly and nail Scotty Anton in the face with that chair. And here's Shane McMahon doing the exact same thing. And I might say, I, you know, I would probably say a much bigger ring. Because let's face it, the ECW ring didn't look as big as the WWE ring. And he's got one chance to do it. It's at WrestleMania. And Shane McMahon does it. And that, that, that blew my mind. Like, at first I was like, he stole RVD's move. But then I was thinking about it. I was like, yeah, but that's still pretty cool. Now there's only two people in the world who can do that move. <laughs> so, again, that, that would become another signature thing that Shane McMahon would do. And then when Van Damme came into the WWE, he, he made sure and showed, hey, I did the Van Terminator. I can do it too. I can do it better than Shane. But Shane McMahon had a really good Van Terminator. He had a really good shooting star press also, even though he missed it uh, because Vince moved. But he had, a, he had a really nice shooting star press. But uh, So that would, that's the birth of the Coast to Coast. We have the Shane McMahon flying off. All these things are hardcore things. So that's, you know, they're, they're, they establish Shane McMahon as this hardcore kind of wrestler, which is crazy to think about, you know. But it makes sense because, like, Shane McMahon, you know, I, I, he did have formal training, obviously, because he's so close to the company. But it makes sense that for him to get noticed, he would have to do these crazy things because people probably didn't associate himself uh, or associate him with being a wrestler because he was the son of Vince McMahon. So it's very smart if you think about it. It's like if I start going in there and I start wrestling like I'm Dean Malenko, you know, everyone's going to be like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, they're not, they're going to probably think it's the, the other guy is making him look good. So Shane McMahon had to kind of do something to help him stand out. And he already had like this cocky, arrogance, you know, fearless attitude about him. So these hardcore stunts really helped them stand out and you know it would lead into right after that right next month backlash and here we are we're fighting at backlash how fitting backlash he would face uh the big show and a last man standing match and it would be at backlash that he would dive off the top of the backlash set so you can see here it looks pretty similar to how the backlash 2000 arena set but he did the same thing during the match they would work their way him and the big show they worked their way to the set uh once again Tess was there to help him and Tess uh knocks big show down or keeps big show down so that Shane McMahon climbs up the backlash the funny thing about that match is uh you know, Shane McMahon, he climbs all the way to the top of the Backlash set. And then he crosses himself, much like he would do uh, with the Hell in the Cell that he recently jumped off. He crossed himself before he jumped off to the, do the elbow drop on The Undertaker. He does that in that Backlash match when he's jumping off the Backlash set. So, very interesting. Um, and he, he nails it. He hits... You know, Big Show with an elbow and onto the crash pad. Tess props him up on one of like the camera equipment so that he can stand up for the 10 count because it's the last man standing match. And we, again, another iconic moment, another hardcore extreme moment coming from Shane McMahon uh, at Backlash 2000. Um, we wouldn't see Shane McMahon a little bit for that. I mean, he would be in and out, in and out. 
Uh, but the next big hardcore moment in my eyes and one of my personal favorite matches of all time, King of the Ring 2001. I mean, when you think about Shane McMahon, you got to think about King of the Ring 2001, his match against Kurt Angle, his street fight against Kurt Angle, where they beat the crap out of oh, Kurt Angle, really. Kurt Angle beat the crap out of Shane McMahon. But Shane McMahon busted Kurt Angle open in the beginnings of that match. And if this was WWE today, you'd see the refs and everyone trying to cover Kurt Angle and clean him up. But he popped Kurt Angle in the beginning of the match and above his eye. He gave him a, a, a bloody, you know, a bloody mark above his eye. And Kurt Angle's bleeding throughout the whole match. The refs didn't stop it. The refs didn't do anything about it. So um, they fight towards the back of the King of the Ring set once again. So you know something's going to happen. And instead of... Shane McMahon climbing to the top of it so the King of Rings set had these glass panels and Kurt Angle gives Shane McMahon a belly to belly suplex into the glass panel now the glass panel should have broke I mean he threw him hard enough and it didn't and Shane landed straight against the glass panel and goes head first into the ground you can hear the thud and it and the whole audience just cringes and it was like oh my god he just killed Shane McMahon so of course the next thing you gotta do is try it again and Kurt Angle bellies to belly suplexes uh, Shane McMahon and this time he goes through the glass and the glass comes falling down and now Shane McMahon's bloodied and Kurt Angle's shoulder is bloody because the glass fell on him so he goes inside the set, and now he's going to belly to belly suplex like Shane McMahon back out. And again, the glass doesn't break. Does it again. The glass doesn't break. Shane McMahon just keeps landing with a thud. Every time, the audience is just like, oh, but they're cheering. They're into it because they're savages. They just want blood and violence because this is the Attitude Era. And then third time's a charm. He throws him in, and... But this time, he instead of belly to belly is suplex, and he just grabs him head first and throws him in, um, and it brings and drags him all the way back to the ring. Shane McMahon kicks out. The match keeps going. Uh, it was just an amazing match. This is am- I think you know uh, that is one of my favorite matches of all time uh, because it was so exciting and, and again so unexpected. I mean, Kurt Angle was having the second best year. You know, rookie year. His first year was the best rookie year ever. And now the second year, he was just killing it as an in-ring performer. But the match he put on with Shane, I mean, both of them, they just stole the show. And Kurt Angle especially, I mean, he had two matches before that that night because he was in the King of the Ring tournament and Shane McMahon cost him to lose it as part of their feud. So Edge would win that year. And it was just amazing. And, you know, Kurt Angle has spoken about that match. Shane McMahon, I think, also recently spoke about it on the uh, Mick Foley podcast that they did on the network. But I remember Kurt Angle did a podcast with Jim Ross where he talked about it. And, that you know, the glass was supposed to be the breakable glass. And it was supposed to break right right away, you know, the sugar glass. And uh, they ordered the wrong glass. And obviously they didn't realize it until the match happened. And... Jim Ross asked them, so whose call was it to try it again? And Kurt Angle said, Shane. <laughs> Shane was like, do it again. Do it again, you bastard. <laughs> like, he's like, he's like, what do I do? It's like, he's, he's, he's my boss. Of course I'm going to do it again. And Shane just kept telling him to do it until it breaks. So, I mean, hearing that so many years later just warmed my heart. And then what also warmed my heart was when Mick Foley asked Shane McMahon what his favorite match was that he ever did. And Shane McMahon, you know, I remember Mick Foley asking him, what was your favorite match ever in WWE? And then I remember, like, screaming at my team, like, my Kindle. I was watching it on my Kindle on the WWE Network. I was like, King of the Ring 2000. And then Shane McMahon just calmly goes, King of the Ring 2000 with Kurt Angle. I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you want to talk about hardcore matches, and that's the thing about the hardcore championship path that I'm starting to realize, you know, there's been a lot of great hardcore matches that didn't involve the hardcore championship. So that's why I wanted to highlight someone like Shane McMahon because 
his legacy really revolved around a lot of these hardcore matches. And those those matches in particular, I feel like, set the bar so that every time we got a Shane McMahon match, we kind of knew what to expect. We knew if it was a street fight, he was going to put his body on the line just as much as the other guy. You know, no matter who it was, whether it be Kurt Angle or Kane or The Rock or all these other guys he've had or, or Randy Orton even, you know, later on. You know, all these guys he would have street fights with, Shawn Michaels, um, you know, or if he was doing these matches, uh, you know, he, you know, it, it when he fought Kane at Unforgiven 2003, they had another last man standing match and they're fighting and Kane go and uh, Kane's knocked down onto the floor and Shane McMahon's leading, leaning against the set of Unforgiven 2003. And, you know, he's out of breath because he thinks he stopped Kane, but he doesn't. he's not too sure. And then he's leaning across the set, and he looks up, and he glances up, and the crowd loses it. And I didn't remember that detail from that match. I remember it was another match where he dived off the top of the set. You know, Unforgiven 2003, he dives off the top of that set. But it's just so funny that... You know, that was the payoff for WrestleMania 32 when Shane McMahon leans against the Hell in a Cell and he glances up. He did the same exact thing in Unforgiven 2003 and the fans knew it. And, you know, that's who Shane McMahon was. I think that that's what we, I mean, I know I at least remember the most about Shane McMahon is his, high, his, his you know, daredevil like stunts, you know, like. Who in their right mind, especially you're the son of the, of the person who owns the company, would dive off of these? Anything could happen. And he missed. He missed with Kane, just like he missed with Undertaker. He goes up top. He crosses himself. The fans are excited because they're going to see Shane McMahon jump off of the top of a set again. And he misses, and Kane wins the match. So uh, kind of ironic that the Brothers of Destruction both have wins over Shane McMahon because of Shane McMahon missing his top of the set diving <laughs> maneuver but in pretty much any other hardcore match or last man standing match or whatever Shane McMahon would always go for the you know uh, elbow drop from the turnbuckle to the Spanish announce table or the coast to coast so Shane McMahon he only held the hardcore championship for seven days but I think Shane McMahon probably played a much larger role you know, as as almost as great as Mick Foley did, it, honestly, in terms of these hardcore matches and these street matches in the WWE. I mean, when you think about Shane McMahon, you think, you know, as they would probably say in ECW, you know, he's hardcore. So I hope you enjoyed this Let's Play. I enjoyed watching all the Shane McMahon matches and playing as Shane McMahon was kind of fun because I just, in my mind, I was just thinking, man, if they only let you die from the top of an arena no mercy but anyway i hope you like this match got more hardcore championship let's plays coming and as always this is youtube you know what to do like comment subscribe i am be better gamer and until next time keep watching all the wrestling thank you